I don't know if you've ever been disappointed in yourself because you really thought you were above doing something that you did. A failure, a mistake, a relationship that went bad, a fall, something that you just don't know if you can ever get up off the ground about. But I've got such good news for you this morning that failure is not the last word. Forgiveness is stronger than failure. Can you say amen to that? And I'm going to give you three words in this message. It's all you'll need, really, is that the first one is failure. We're going to look at Peter's failure. It's obvious. The Bible never hides people's failures. He wants us to relate to where people came from. And remember, all this happened in a span of 50 days. What I'm preaching to you today happened in seven weeks. And then was his forgiveness, and then finally was his freedom. Let's talk first about his failure. And I don't have to do a long time on this, but I do want you to relate because failure just means we're human. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I mean, God's glory is a standard that we're never going to really attain to. We're going to do our best, but we are going to learn. The Bible says the righteous falls seven times, but he gets up again. Can I have an amen? amen. So if failure is possible. It, it doesn't have to happen. The Bible says he can keep us from falling. But what I've learned is that humility is what keeps you from falling and from failure. If you, my daddy used to teach me, if you are on your face, flat on the ground, you can't fall. The center of gravity is too low. So I've been in ministry now. This is my 52nd year to be preaching the gospel. I started preaching at 16. I'm 68 right now. And all I've learned is, Lord, if I can just stay a low enough place in myself where with myself I know that I have no trust in my own flesh and my trust is in you, then I don't have to worry about failure. But I've watched so many people, even high leaders and all kind of people fail, and it always comes back to the Peter syndrome, the overconfidence. And notice with me, just 50 days before Pentecost, in the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, Jesus is having a meal in Luke chapter 22. He washed their feet. So humble. This is our Lord. This is our Savior. He's so humble that he took the servant's place and he washed the feet. But the interesting thing is he probably did it because of verse 24. And I'm going to put that on the screen for you. Now you're in the story with me. It says, a dispute arose among them as to which of them would be regarded as the greatest. Are you kidding me? You know, the environment of competitiveness was right there at the Lord's Supper, at the Last Supper. They're not talking about Jesus. They're talking about who's the greatest, who's going to sit on his right hand and on his left. And, and all this smack is going on. And I believe that's when he got the towel and rose and started washing their feet and said, hey, guys. It's not about who's the big shot. Nobody's the big shot. We're all just little shots hooked on to Jesus. Isn't that right? And so then Peter, of course, here he goes, his athlete's mouth problem. He said, Lord, he said, all these guys may forsake you. I bet he stood up when he said it. He said, I got news, Lord. I'll never deny you. In fact, he said, I'm ready to go to prison with you. In fact, Lord, I'm ready to die. If you die, I'm ready to die. And the Lord looked at him and said these words, and they, and they, they ring in my mind. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned again, Strengthen your brothers. Now, of course, Simon denied that. He said, no, Lord, I'll never, I'll never fall. But I want you to look at that verse. Dissect it with me just a minute. I'm talking about the failure part. He called him Simon. Isn't that interesting? He, I thought you said he, he, he changed his name to Peter, and he did. Peter means the rock, the stable one. But Simon means the shifting one like a reed that blows in the wind. He did not call him by his new spiritual name. He called him by his old name because the way Peter was talking right then sounded like the old Peter, the competitive Peter, 
the cocky Peter, the, the leader that could always talk the smack. He said, now, Simon, Simon, by the way, guys, whenever Jesus calls your name twice, it's not good. <laughs> Martha, Martha. Saul, Saul. A anytime. And he said, Simon, Simon. He said, Satan. See, remember these words. Satan has demanded that he might sift you like wheat. You have an enemy, and it's not other people. My daddy taught me years ago, he said, Larry, the number one lesson I learned in 67 years of ministry, he was in the ministry, he said, is that people are not your enemy. The devil is your enemy. And you say, well, you know, I don't know if the devil's real. Well, that's his first lie. He's convinced you of that. He is very real. Though he's invisible, Peter later wrote in his epistle, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So when he said Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat, I thought about a friend of mine who was a Golden Gloves boxing champion in Louisiana. And in one of his fights, he was really getting not just beat, but whooped. Y'all know the difference here in Tulsa. And he got back to the chair. His, his nose was, of course, bleeding. His ears were bleeding. Both eyes, he said, were swollen, completely shut. The guy was tearing him up. And his coach, trying to encourage him, came over to Carl. His name was Carl. He said, Carl, he said, get back in there, champ. He said, he hadn't laid a glove on you yet. <laughs> and Carl couldn't even see. And so he leaned up toward the coach. He said, coach. If he hadn't hit me, I need you to keep your eye on that referee then because I'm getting hit from somewhere. <laughs> so many Christians are ignorant of Satan. They don't know he exists. Oh, yes, he's real, but how many of you know he's defeated by the power of the name of Jesus? Oh, yes. And notice what Jesus told Simon. He said, Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat. He's obtained by permission. To sift you like wheat. He's referring to the farmers of Palestine. Now we think of sifting as like you take some flour and you put it in the little thing. You're going to make biscuits and you're going to turn the little crank. Well, that's one thing. But they had their wheat piled in a threshing floor. And they took a big pitchfork, basically. And when it was windy, they threw the wheat up in the air. And the chaff was still on the wheat, and the chaff was lighter than the wheat, and it would blow away down the field. So thousands and thousands of times they threw that, tossed it up in the air. Some of you kind of feel that way right now. Man, I've been through this last year. Man, I've been through that. Man, I've been through that problem relationally, and that problem with business, and this and that. And you wonder what in the world is going on, but you'll notice something was separating from the wheat. That which was fake was being blown away, and that which was real and true and faithful was falling back down to the ground. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. I'm going to say it a little different way. The shaking is actually a part of the making. Do you agree with that? And the sifting is really revealing your gifting. This is, the, this is what happens in and the devil thinks he's destroying you if you fail or if you've made a mistake. But he hadn't destroyed you. He's actually developing you. Come on, Nate. Somebody ought to say amen to me. All of us make mistakes. But if we rise up and we say, thank you, Lord, that my old cockiness and my old pride that I thought I'd never make a mistake is gone. It's kind of like if you buy a new car, you know, the worst thing you can do is park it way out in the back of Walmart somewhere so nobody dings it. You might as well just go ahead and take a hammer and just tap on it one time so you get that behind you. Come on, right? <laughs> well, listen, all of us, you're looking at a room full of forgiven sinners. Can you say amen? So Peter's failure, and I love this part. Jesus said, yeah, the devil's going to try to sift you, but I've prayed for you. I have prayed for you. Now, look, you can call the prayer line over at the prayer tower, and that's good. I love to call them. But when Jesus starts praying for you, good things are going to start happening. How many of you believe he's the great high priest of our confession? And he never stops praying for you. The devil don't have a chance in your life with Jesus praying over you. 
And then he said these words that your faith may not fail. Your faith will not fail. Your fakeness may have failed and been blown away, but your faith, the part of you that believes in Jesus Christ, the part of you that got born again, is not going to fail, though you outwardly fail. And he says, and when you are strengthened, look, look at the last part of this verse. He says, and when, the message Bible says, when you have come through your time of testing, Turn to your companions and give them a fresh start. Can this, this is really great, really. It started off with Satan has good, demanded to sift you. But now we discover that when we are completely through that testing, we're going to help other people. I looked at that video this morning. A girl that was in sex trafficking. A girl that was sold by her mother into sex trafficking. What a trial. What a failure. What a, what a life that looks so hopeless. And then look at what Jesus has done. And she's encouraging people in this service that they can make it too. 22 verses later. Peter had followed Jesus out of the garden. In case you don't know the story, he was the only disciple who followed close by to the courtyard where the court was trying Jesus. And I believe he was watching through a window or something, and a girl looks up, and the Bible in John calls it a charcoal fire, kind of like your barbecue pit. And they're warming their hands. It's cold. And Peter's looking in. And she says, you know what, dude? I think I recognize you. I believe you were one of the guys that came into town with Jesus. And he said, no, 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 I wasn't. And another man spoke up a little while later. said, no, I, I was in the garden. I think you were the one that cut the servants, the high priest servant's ear off uh, in the garden. And she said, no, man, I have never met Jesus Christ. I don't know him. Who are you talking about? I don't know this guy. And then a third time, the little girl said again, no, 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 wait. I see you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. And now it says he cursed. He cursed himself in Greek, it says. He, he, he used profanity, words that he'd never used for a long time maybe, and said, I'm telling you, blankety, blank, blank, I don't know that man. And at that moment, the rooster crowed. You know, it's amazing to hear that 50 days before Pentecost, Peter was uttering expletives about himself and about God. You know, it's amazing, isn't it, how we love the Lord. I heard a pastor friend talk about that he bought a riding lawnmower from a man, maybe off Facebook or something. He found it. He went to see the riding lawnmower, and the guy said it's in good shape. It had a Briggs & Stratton engine. I don't know if you know this, but the Briggs & Stratton engine was created by God to sanctify our lives. I don't know if you know that or not. <laughs> because he said, this engine doesn't start very quickly. He said, sometimes you may have to pull it about 10 times or more before it starts. He said, and in fact, if you pull it about 10 times, it will make you cuss. He didn't know the guy was a pastor, and the pastor was offended. He said, sir, he said, I have been a, a minister for over 25 years, and I have not even thought of a curse word in 25 years. The guy looked at him and said, all right. He said, you pull it about 10 or 15 times, they'll all come back to you again. <laughs> How many of you know what I'm talking about? All right, let's turn the page. We got the failure part. The rooster crowed. And at that moment, and I'm reading now the same chapter, Luke 22, after the woman said what she said, the Lord turned, verse 61, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Now, I don't know if it was through a window or through a door. Peter's warm in his hands, and he blanked, he blanked this and that. And then he looks again, and at that moment, it couldn't have been a coincidence, everybody. The Lord turned, and he just looked at him. They locked eyes. You know, Kenneth Hagin saw Jesus, 1951, talked to him for an hour and a half. You've heard that story. And all he could describe the eyes of Jesus Christ as was wells of liquid love. I believe when the Lord looked at him, it wasn't a look of scorn, disdain, hatred. 
I believe those eyes that locked with Peter were filled with tears. They were eyes of love. I love you. I love you, Peter. You know, sometimes it's just the revelation that Jesus actually loves you that brings you out of your failures. And I love the next verse. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Let's talk about phase two. Somebody here maybe online or wherever you are, you're, you're stuck in phase one. You cannot get out of that failure cycle and what you did wrong and what you continue to do wrong. A habit, a bondage, an addiction. You cannot get out of it. But I'm telling you, Jesus loves you today. Would you agree with that? He loves you. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Isn't that interesting? Doesn't just say he kind of sniffled a little bit. And I'm not saying you have to cry to show that you've truly repented. But often, when there's a true sense that we have disappointed the Lord himself, tears come and flow because we realize, like the woman who was at the feet of Jesus, a prostitute, and he, she bathed her feet in, his, in her tears, his feet in her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head. And he said, this woman, your sins are forgiven you. There's something about true repentance and not just remorse or regret. That just means I did something wrong, I failed, but what I'm really upset about is that I lost something in the process. True repentance is godly sorrow. And what that really means, everybody, is that, Lord, I'm not concerned about what I've lost. I'm concerned about what you lost when I did that. I'm concerned about a family that was lost. I'm concerned, Lord, about a, a reputation that was lost. Not my own, but that I embarrassed you. You see, there's a whole difference in Peter. That's all he could think about when he found him a tree somewhere and leaned over on his elbow and just shook. The big fisherman finally hit bottom. I believe the man was forgiven at that moment. I really do. But here's an interesting thought. In John's gospel, the Lord took his forgiveness one step more. Can I talk to you about that too? Because a lot of Christians truly are forgiven for their past, but they have a very difficult time forgiving themselves. That's as important as receiving forgiveness is that you know that you have forgiven yourself for the foolishness that you got involved in. So now go forward 10 or 12 days. I don't know how many days Peter gave up on the ministry. He said these words, I'm going back to fishing. Now, all that says to me is he knows he's forgiven. He's even been with the Lord already in a room eight days later. But he's just ashamed of his behavior. And he can't see himself being used of God ever again. And the Bible says, he said, I'm going fishing. Seven disciples followed him. They fished all night. They caught nothing. John 21. And suddenly they see a figure on the shore. And one of the disciples says, I believe that's Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. Now Peter, true to form, dove head first into the boat. He didn't wait for the boat to get to land. He dove in. That's Peter. And he swam to shore and he got up on the shore. Christ had made a charcoal fire. In Greek, it's the same exact words of the fire that he had denied the Lord 40 days or 10 to 12 days earlier. Christ was cooking bread and fish, and he said, come have some breakfast, Peter, just the two of them. The other guys are still on their way. And he looks across this same fire. He said, Peter, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, I do. No, he said, Peter, do you really love me? Yes, I do, Lord. Thirdly, he said, Peter, do you really love me? And he said, Lord, you know me. You know I love you. Isn't it amazing? Christ recreated the moment of his greatest failure to bring him to the moment of his greatest restoration. Three times he said with cursing and profanity, no. And Jesus wanted him three times to say with tenderness, yes. You know, I don't know where you failed. 
I don't know where you got off the boat. I don't know when you failed. I, you may be here for the first time in months or years. Or I don't know what happened last year. I don't know. I don't know where you failed. But I've got such good news for you. The Savior has cooked fish and bread for you. And he wants to serve you. And he wants to hear you say, I love you, Jesus. Can I tell you? One moment with the Lord of fellowship, and it'll all be healed. The shame left. But let's fast forward to the third phrase, Peter's freedom. Yes, failure. Yes, forgiveness and restoration. But today is Pentecost. Because when the day of Pentecost had fully come, Acts 2.1 they were gathered in an upper room in Jerusalem. Peter was there. Now, I'm talking 50 days after his failure. I've been in that room. I've, they say that's the upper room. It's a strange feeling to be standing in this large room. There's only one little door over in the corner. And suddenly, a sound from heaven filled the whole house. It must have sounded like a tornado. If you've ever heard a tornado here in Oklahoma, it sounds like a locomotive. And they heard the noise all across Jerusalem where thousands and hundreds of thousands of pilgrims had gathered for the day of, for the feast of Pentecost or the feast of weeks, one of the three major feasts of the Jewish people. They had come from Arabic nations. They had come from uh, Roman provinces. They spoke in 15 or 16 different languages. And they heard that noise and thousands rushed together to this little upper room. And they began to yell out loud, what's going on? And they heard them speaking in other tongues, not Aramaic or not Hebrew. They were speaking in the languages of the people groups that had come, of the wonderful works of God. And there's Peter over in a corner, and the Spirit of God fell upon him, and fire fell on his head. And Peter received the boldness and the power of God. And the Lord Jesus said to him, I believe by his Spirit, Peter, I need you to go get in that doorway and stand on those stairs. There's thousands of people out there waiting to hear the word of the Lord, and I want you to go speak for them. I believe he sat there for a few moments praying in the Spirit and said, Lord, you know what I did. Lord, you know just 50 days ago what I did. I don't think I deserve to do that. But when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, I'm talking now about freedom. Something leaves your background, your past, your insufficiency, your limitations. When you get baptized in the Holy Ghost, you begin to soar like an eagle and do what God has called you to do in your lifetime. He preached 22 verses and 3,000 people gave their hearts to Jesus Christ and got water baptized. The greatest sermon in the history of the church. It launched the church. And then he healed that other man. And then his shadow. And then he raised the dead. And then it all happened 50 days after his failure. What am I saying? Reminds me of a story that when I was a student here at ORU. I, I was a singer. I like writing music, and I wrote a song on the campus there. I'm talking about 1974, 75. And the campus liked it. A lot of people wanted me to, to do that uh, different places. And I had written it, but I had a hard time performing it. And the, the chaplain called me, and he said, hey, everybody's talking about this song. I want you to come to Maybe Center. You guys know where that is. And I want you to do that song in chapel tomorrow. Well, the only problem with that was that when I got up in front of people to preach or sing or anything, often I would hyperventilate. And that just means your lungs only get about one inch of air and you, you, you can't catch your breath to sing or to, to speak. And all I could think about is I'm going to get up tomorrow in front of 4,500 students and I'm going to lose my breath, and I'm going to open my mouth, and nothing's going to come out. And it's going to be totally awkward and the worst moment of my life. And I said to the chaplain, I cannot do that. He said, why not? I said, I have this problem with hyperventilating. He said, well, I'm going to introduce you tomorrow, and whether you come out or not is your business. That was not fair, was it? You, you that are even afraid to pray in public, you know what I'm talking about. 
And he hung up the phone. And I did not sleep much that night. But that night about midnight, the Lord spoke to me. And he said, you see a wall of fire in front of you. But I'm telling you, if you'll walk through it by the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll look back and it's a wall of smoke. It never really was anything at all. All that was stopping you was your own fear of failure. So I got my guitar and I walked across that campus, sat behind stage, and I remember he called my name. I said, Holy Spirit, let's go. Without you, I can't do it, but I believe I can with you. And I sat on the stool, strummed my first notes, and I put it in the key of letter. As we say, I opened my mouth and I let her fly and something came out. And my life has never been the same. Come on, let's give the Lord praise for that. I'm talking about freedom. Freedom from what's holding you back. It's all gone when you truly get filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, I heard a story, and I'm going to close with this, of a huge blimp in World War II. We've heard of the German blimp, the Hindenburg, that went down in New Jersey, 750 feet long. Well, the United States had their own blimp, the USS Akron. And that blimp, I'm talking about in the 1940s, in World War II, it was stationed in San Diego, California. And one day after it had been flying somewhere, it came to land at the base, the naval base in San Diego. And the way they landed this blimp, we're talking about a blimp that is two and a half times the size of a football field. Massive. They got about 400 feet down and they threw a rope from the nose of the blimp. And that rope fell all the way to the ground, and hundreds of sailors were on that, down on the ground, and they got the rope and held it, and that, that huge blimp would gradually come down to the ground while the sailors were holding that long rope. But something happened. Instead of coming down, the blimp suddenly lurched, and the nose went up. The rope was snatched out of the hands of hundreds of sailors, but some of them grabbed the rope as it went through their hands, and it pulled them off the ground, and most of them let go. Instead, four men did not let go. One of them at 15 feet up let go, and he fell and broke his arm. But the, but the USS Akron nose went up, and it kept rising, and 200 feet later, the other two of the four dropped off both to their death, it leaving one sailor who was still holding on. His name, 18-year-old Charles Cowart. I believe he was actually from Oklahoma. He was holding the rope, and everyone, thousands of people, were breathlessly waiting as he went up 500 feet, 1,000 feet, and they thought this is going to be the most awful thing that's ever happened. But something, for some reason, he did not drop. He hung on 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour. Finally, the Hindenburg captain went out over the Pacific Ocean and tried to re-land it coming in a different direction from the wind. On the way, they figured out a way that they could haul this man up because he was still holding on to the rope. They didn't know how he was doing it. They, they put a winch out and they reeled it up. And this man, after two hours of hanging on that rope, was winched up into the cockpit, and they got him safely on board. They landed the blimp. All of the media was there. They opened the door, expecting him to come out on a stretcher, and he walked out under his own power, this 18-year-old boy that had held on for two hours. And they put the microphones in his face. How did you do that? How are you alive? What did you do? How did you hang on for two hours? He said, oh, I didn't hang on. He said, I realized that everybody else was just trying to hang on, so I had a part of the rope that I could pull around me a couple of times and tie it into a very strong nautical knot. And he said it was positioned on my body in such a way that my arms were free, my legs were free, and I was really down under the blimp just swinging free 2,000 feet up for two hours. Come on now, some of you are ahead of me. You're getting the message. God never intended for you to hold on the rest of your life. It's not about you never failing and you never falling. 
and you never making a mistake. My brothers and sisters, it's about that rope. We have an anchor of the soul, and it is Jesus Christ, the righteous. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, and you tie that rope around you, and that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and you can begin to swing free. You can sing for the Lord. You can preach for the Lord. You can give out tracts for the Lord. You can deliver water bottles and meals for the Lord. You can do whatever God calls you to do because you're swinging free in the Holy Ghost. Come on, let's give the Lord praise for it tonight. I said, let's give the Lord a great shout of praise. Wow. Now, will you back up with me to that first charcoal fire? I just wonder if online or somebody that stepped in here this morning, I love you. I love Tulsa. I lived here five years. I don't know, and I was praying early this morning for you. Lord, bring that man, that woman. But inwardly, you're still back, stuck at the old charcoal fire, disappointed with yourself. And today, the Holy Spirit drew you here, and he says to you, I love you. Jesus is locking eyes with you from heaven. He says, I'm praying for you to make the right choice right now. Turn your back on your past. If some tears come, good, because you truly know it's hurt me the way you've lived. But I want to bring you to a place in me that you don't even recognize yourself. It's called freedom. Freedom in the Spirit of God. Would you close your eyes with me, everyone in this room? No one moving or disturbing. In the next few moments, I'm going to pray over anyone that wants a prayer. If you're here and you would say, you've been talking to me this whole message. I'm Peter. I need forgiveness. And you say, does the Lord love me? Yes, he does. He's looking right at you. If you would like that prayer, and I, I, maybe some in here don't need that prayer. They've already received the Lord. They've got him in their life. They're filled with the Spirit, all that. I'm talking about you don't know the Lord or you've, you've backslid away from the Lord or for something has happened in your life, a failure. And you would say to me, I need forgiveness and I need restoration. Would you like to be included in a prayer? It's going to be simple, very easy, but it's going to be heartfelt. If that's you, and you would say, Pastor, don't close this service until you let me pray that prayer with you. Here's what I want you to do. If you want to be included in that prayer, without hesitation, I want you to slip up your hand and hold it as high as you can anywhere in this building. Hold it up now. That's right. I see your hands over there. That's right. It's very difficult to see, so raise it up high. I see your hand right down here and right there. God bless you. And over here, up in the bleacher area, just wave it at me. Raise it up high. That's right. I see you over there, this man, this lady. God bless you over there, back over there. All across this room, people are raising up their hand. Now you can put it down again if you raised it. In a moment, we're all going to stand with our heads bowed. And you that raised your hand, you say, I want that prayer. Here's all I want you to do. I want you to move from that old charcoal fire to the new one where Jesus cooked breakfast. I want you to receive your forgiveness and your restoration. Let's say that charcoal fire, I'm going to step out on this apron. Let's say it's right down here. But you need to move from where you were to where you want to be. When we stand, I want you to slip past the neighbor beside you to the aisle, even from the bleachers. And it's only going to take you about 30 seconds to come from where you are to where I'm standing. And I want you to stand shoulder to shoulder across this whole front of the building I'm going to pray that prayer over you and with you. Jesus' forgiveness is going to come, and the Spirit of God, the day of Pentecost, is going to happen to you right now. Would everyone now stand with me in the building, quietly, with your heads bowed, and I want all of you, men, women, young people, you raised a hand, start slipping past your neighbor into the aisle and start walking this direction right now. I'm waiting for you, just 30 seconds. That's right, here they come. Oh, that's good. Give them a hand clap as they come. Here comes about 10 people up that aisle. Here comes about another 15 people from that direction. 
10 or 10 or 15 more. Now you're going to have to form a single file line because it's going to be a lot of it. It's going to go from one side of this building to the other. So come right now. Come on, give them a great hand clap. You're ready to get out of the failure stage into the forgiveness stage. You're ready to receive your restoration. Come on, Victory. This is a new day for you. Just make a long line as far as you can go on around. Let them go all the way that way. Thank you, Holy Spirit. What a mighty move on Pentecost Sunday. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. We're just going to wait on the Lord just a moment. There are a few other people still stepping out. Thank you, Lord. Don't let shame stop you. I don't know who you are, sir. Don't let the number of marriages you've been in stop you. Don't let anything stop you. Surely you hadn't done what Peter's done, and Peter's saying, please come to the second charcoal fire. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So many people down here. Amazing. Put your hand over your heart. Would you do that if you're standing down here? The heart is where failure is. And the head, of course. Sin is in your heart. But Jesus looked at Peter because he was saying, I'm about to go shed my blood for you. I'm about to be nailed to a cross for you. And right now, I want you to lock eyes with Jesus. Your eyes are closed in the natural. But I want you to lock eyes with Jesus from the cross. Let's see him looking down from you at the cross. And he's saying something with his lips. You can't hear him, but he's saying, I love you. I love you. Pray this prayer out loud now. Are you ready to get saved? Are you ready to come back to the Lord? Say it out loud. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross. You had me on your mind. And you know my faults. You know my failures. You know my limitations. Wash me in your blood. Cleanse me, Lord Jesus. Forgive me of my past. And now I say to you, yes, I love you. Yes, I love you. Yes, I love you. Thank you, Lord. Now, I'd like everyone to lift up your hands. Holy hands. Holy hands. And I want you to pray. Everybody in the whole building, lift up your hands. And I want you to pray in your prayer language. If you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you can pray. The Bible says to yourself. But I want you to release that prayer language. And I don't want you to let shame of your past stop you from ministering in this powerful church when they have an outreach i want you to grab your phone and your bible and i want you to head out with your tennis shoes on and say i'm going to preach today i'm going to testify today i'm going to be used of god the rest of my life lord i pray for a new baptism of the holy spirit to come upon this mighty church It was begun in the flames of revival in the 1980s. And now 40 years later with a new generation leader, this church shall blaze the way of revival in this nation. I thank you every leader here, every small group leader here, every children's worker here, every person on the youth ministry, every person is engaged with the fire and the power of God. May the anointing of God be on each of these that are standing in front of me. That's right, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the power of the Spirit of God for freedom. Freedom. Swing free in your life. You're not holding on to God. He's got you. He's holding on to you right now. Blessing be the name of the Lord upon you in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whoa, I feel the glory of God in here. Come on, let's give the Lord praise together, everybody. Amen.